welcome to the office of the Carl Koenig Institute in Pennsylvania, where I am at the moment. Now, I think it's really very special that you begin this meeting with uh, a verse for America and a verse for what is happening in the world today, particularly in the U Ukraine, of course. Um, because we are living in a very special time. Okay, so of course we can say every time is a special time, but um, uh, it is a special time for us who are coming together now. And it's important, I think, that we connect what we are doing with what is happening in the world around us. And meeting in the space of the Anthroposophic Society, which is space around the earth and not just in one particular place. That means we are connecting with the history of the Anthroposophic Society, the history of anthroposophy on earth, and really concerning ourselves with the question, how does anthroposophy still attempt to incarnate into this world the way it is. And that is, of course, a process of healing, which we want to uh, try and further. So I think it's important to remember that 100 years ago, and I, I assume you've been speaking about these themes, 100 years ago was a very special year. It was not just the things that Rudolf Stein was founding and speaking about, but it, it was also the year 1922, when I think one can say the opposition against anthroposophy was the strongest. And we know, of course, that that led through the year of 1922 to Rudolf Steiner having to confine himself more and more to Switzerland and no longer journeying into Germany for the first Waldorf school, for instance, and the impulse is given for social life in Germany. He could not return to Germany. And at the end of this year, 1922, of course, was the burning of the Goethe Arnhem. So uh, the, I don't know if we say the height or the depths of opposition against anthroposophy was just exactly now 100 years ago, um, the same time as the inauguration of the Christian community. So we see how also in those times, light and darkness were so close together. We are living in apocalyptic times, but we were living, or not we, but Rudolf Steiner was living in apocalyptic times 100 years ago too. So remembering that, I'd like to start off by saying a few words about Karl Koenig, someone who was very strongly conscious of his historic context and very conscious about what had just happened with the Anthroposophical Society, with the Goethe Annam, when he joined society in 1925 just one week after Rudolf Steiner had died. And at the same time, he felt for the whole of his life, a very strong connection to Rudolf Steiner and the duty, so to speak, to um, attempt to help this impulse into the world. And he was very conscious of it being a healing impulse in many, many levels, many areas. Now, he carried this impulse to heal, this will to heal very strongly, also in very young years in Vienna, where he grew up. And if one is very conscious of the historic context, and at the same time has a strong will to heal, then this connection of consciousness and the will brings about something which one can also call conscience. 
it's very interesting that the English language conscience and consciousness are very close together from a point of view of speech. That's not in every language the case, but in English it is. And we see how this connection between the will, the healing will, and the thought, the consciousness, actually brings about something we can call conscience. That was something which was very strong for Karl Koenig. And he was someone who grew up with two, I would say, two very strong talents. One was this healing impulse, this um, will to heal. And the other side was his musicality. He was a very musical person. And it took quite a struggle in his, uh, in his biography to choose which way he could serve the world best. And in the end, he chose medicine and studied in Vienna, became a physician there in Vienna. And so it, the rest of his life, if, yes, he was certainly a physician, but he carried this artistic impulse very strongly with him. It was the art of healing, which lived very strongly in him, that healing is an art. And at the same time, his um, consciousness, his conscience for social life led him to very artistically work with social, with the social question, with community building, and to try to inaugurate communities that would be healing communities. So that is the, the birthplace, so to speak, of the Campbell movement. But his will to heal was from the very beginning, very clearly to be seen in three directions. The will to heal the human being, that is his medical training, his medical work. But at the same time, he could not imagine healing the human being without healing society, without healing community. And so his attempt at community building can be seen as a, uh, an attempt to plant a seed towards the healing of society, healing of social life. And of course, between the human being and social life, we have the question of the earth we're living on. And this question of healing of the earth belonged very strongly together for him. Now, as I said, Rudolf Steiner had already died when he connected to the Anthropological Society. And so his main uh, point of reference to the Anthropological Society was Ita Wegman, who was a very close friend of Karl Koenig. And maybe you all know, but nevertheless, I would like to mention the fact that she was not only to be the, the leader of the medical section, at the Goethe Arnhem, but Rudolf Steiner actually hoped she would take agriculture into the medical section, which turned out differently in the end because Ita Wegman was not able to take on this task in the um, leadership of the Anthropological Society. But uh, this was what Rudolf Steiner had hoped for. I think that's uh, it's good to know, actually, the agricultural impulse had nothing to do, or not nothing to do, but was not in the first instance a scientific um, impulse or um, an economic impulse, but it was a healing impulse, healing the earth. So this is where Karl Koenig also started his uh, anthropological life, his work life, with Ita Wegmann, first of all, in Allesheim as assistant, and then moved to Silesia, which is now Poland, Hugantine, where he co-founded a curative home. And this was also directly connected to uh, biodynamic work. It was the, the research center of biodynamics in those days, in the uh, late 20s, uh, early 30s. So 
his life was connected very strongly in this um, in this area, and he could only imagine curative education or education at all to be connected to this healing process of the earth. We know, of course, that education, Rudolf Steiner's education impulse, but also his healing impulse in education had very strongly to do with the question of breathing. Now, I know that uh, it's not always easy to understand these processes. And in world of schools today, one has to work on this again and again and again. But the, um, the course for the opening of the world of school actually goes into details about how children learn to breathe in a harmonious way. Breathing understood in various levels, of course, because our waking and sleeping, or waking, sleeping, and dreaming, if you will, this threefold, uh, these threefold levels of consciousness in the human being um, are also a rhythmic pulsing of breathing, a breathing process. The soul is breathing in and breathing out. Um, also on these levels of consciousness. So Rudolf Steiner was also quite clear that um, healing in educating, we are speaking about a, a breathing process. I think it's maybe something that is, uh, has not been discovered enough uh, in the past. And I hope it will be something which will be taken up more strongly in the future because it's not only in America that uh, we hear these words, uh, I can't breathe, but it is a problem of the world. It is a, a social problem. It is a problem of the individual that this breathing process becomes more and more difficult. Speech becomes more and more difficult as a transition from one human being to the other, not just as information flow, but the breathing into the other person and breathing the other person into us in the social process becomes more and more difficult. And so I think not only education, not only healing in a medical sense, but also social life needs today a very strong healing impulse, healing impulse of breathing. Now, I would just like to add to this because we, we did start with the verse because I think mainly of the situation in the Ukraine. Just to remember in the, in the Russian language, there is one single word for the world, the earth, and peace, this word mir, which means both. And I think that's something which is quite amazing, that one word actually has these, for our consciousness in the English speaking world or in Europe, for our consciousness, it's two different things. But the Russian language tells us, no, peace has to do with the situation of the earth. I think it's actually wonderful because the health of the earth and the health of social life belong together. And that is something which is instinctively known in the Russian language. I, I don't necessarily mean that it is conscious for people or um, that that even always plays a part, but it is actually embedded into the Russian language. And it needs to be embedded in our consciousness, I think, today, that the, the health of the earth, the health of social life, the health of the human being belong together. And we need to find um, a, a healing process of breathing together with the rhythms of the world, of the earth. And in this way, we will find towards peace on earth. 
Now, I, I would like to start uh, now with words from Karl Koenig, because as I say, this was his life's task in a way, this question of social life, the human being and the being of the earth. And he very often wrote a verse. He, he wrote a lot of poetry. That's not so well known, but uh, he was quite a, a poet. And he liked to write a little verse for his calendar. You know, we had a calendar on the wall and he just wrote a verse for each year. And uh, they're very simple verses, but, but I think sometimes quite deep at the same time. And for 1963, this verse he wrote, I actually think is very fitting for our times now. It's the following. May the circle of this year, every day and every hour, be for you a space where peace can live, so that from your soul's very depths, each heartbeat speaks with great sincerity, yes, to freedom I will offer space. Maybe I'll read that again. May the circle of this year, every day and every hour, be for you a space where peace can live, so that from your soul's very depths, each heartbeat speaks with great sincerity, yes, to freedom I will offer space. That is uh, quite usual for Karl Koenig to use this, um, this image of the heart and the heartbeat. So the heart and the lungs as the um, organs which create actually the, the rhythm of breathing. Now, as I said, his connection to this question of healing breath uh, goes back very, very far. And when he started in Pilgramshain in Silesia, where, which is now Poland, uh, he gave a talk there, which I would like to use this evening, because I think it's a talk which speaks to our times very strongly. And some of the, the words there could be spoken today quite as well as then. 1932 it is. And of course, already he was um, experiencing the first throes of National Socialism and the difficulties which were already arising. But uh, he spoke very deeply about the festivals and the process of breathing of the earth. And I would just like to read a few lines from this lecture he gave in 1932. If we now realize that we have practically lost sight of the way in which our life is bound up with the seasons, we shall see why it is that we can no longer recognize the power and necessity of the great festivals of the year. Those, however, who live with children soon become aware that these seasonal festivals are necessities of life for the child, without which they can hardly exist. It is really an offense against the being of the child to deprive them of any real experience of these festivals. And thus, to let them grow up as foolish as we ourselves are in this respect. So that is sort of a counter picture of education, to let children grow up as foolish as we are. If we no longer believe that these festivals are essential for our own being, we shall naturally find it impossible to accept the idea that they are also essential for the life of the earth and the great breathing process of the earth. We have learned to think biologically in the last decades 
that we have altogether forgotten to take into account soul and spirit. So there already we find him speaking about this connection of our own, well, also the bodily breathing to this breathing process of the earth in the seasons, going out into summer, breathing out, so to speak, into summer and breathing in in winter time. So that's a duality of breathing. First of all, we usually think of breathing as, as this duality, this process of breathing in and breathing out. There is more to it than that, of course. As soon as we think of the connection between the heart and the lungs, it is no longer just a duality. But I, I will add, come to that still later. So I think these are very strong words, how we've really forgotten the connection of the human being to the seasons and therefore forgotten that we need the festivals. It's um, yeah something which is a necessity, not just for the human being, but for the earth itself. So I, I do think this is uh, one point we could go back to or try and attain today in our questions of the health of the earth, that we don't just think about carbon emissions and things like that, or the rising of the temperature and, and the sort of thing, the, the physical body of the earth, but we need to turn, especially today, to the soul and spirit being of the earth, which is the being which breathes in and out with the seasons. So he's leading us there into depths of questions of ecology, which we've lost. And I think uh, if he, he there says, you know, how we've uh, lost the connection between the human being and the earth in this respect, uh, this was 1932. How is that today? And out of what do we celebrate festivals today, for instance? Do we see them as, in this process of breathing? Or are they just points of time in our calendar somewhere? Or how is that? Do we actually experience time as a being? Or do we experience it more spatially? As I say, a calendar is something in space, not in time. And so therefore one tends, if one celebrates festivals at all, to celebrate them in a sort of a linear fashion. And it's not so easy to put oneself into this process of breathing. But I, I would like to, to come back to that. Now, what Karl Koenig worked at in those times with his work in curative education, with his medical work, was to ask where do we find these elements of the seasons in the human body? How are we really connected to this breathing process physically? Not just from a thinking point of view or from a soul point of view, but quite physically, where do we find this? And I would actually like to um, tell you about that uh, a little, because there he um, describes how our bones are actually the pole of winter within us. It's the, the part of the human constitution, which is, so to speak, frozen. It's the hardest part of our physical body, the skeleton, like a, a winter being within us. And yet, at the same time, we need to realize, just like in winter, actually in the bones, in the, we could almost say in the most dead part of the human being, there is the uh, small space where actually life comes to being, where the red blood is perpetually created, the, the wellspring of life is, is within the bones. Maybe perhaps uh, like 
the seeds in the earth germinating in wintertime and waiting to meet the light and uh, warmth from spring. So there we see winter moving into springtime in the year, but also within the human body. Perpetually, it's not something which is uh, once a year, of course, So that is something which continues throughout life. And he says there is one part of the skeleton which doesn't actually belong to the bones. It's something of its own, but is in a way like a, a model of the whole skeleton. And that is the larynx. And he uses beautiful words there. As I say, Karl Koenig stayed an artist all his life. And when he spoke, when he wrote, he wrote also as an artist. He um, used his imagination, but also was always attempting to arouse our imagination to uh, transform thinking, to transform also something uh, which tends to be dead and dying in the human being, to enliven this process. And there he says the, the larynx is the cradle in which the word is born continuously. It's a continuous Christmas festival within the skeleton. And just as we need this skeleton to create new life within the human being, so also we can say without Christmas, the world would, as he says, ossify. It would become as dead and solid and frozen as a bone. And then he speaks about the muscles, the red fiber structure of the body um, built and threaded together like leaves and the stem of a plant. And so this thickened green fluid in the plant is a similar structure in the human body. There we find the flow thickened to become muscle in the human being. And there, of course, the, the central muscle, the main muscle of the human being is the heart. So in this area, this red flow, which becomes muscle being, we have as the central organ, the central muscle, the heart, which is perpetually the overcomer of death processes. So we're leading now from the bones, we're in the bone marrow, the blood germinates, so to speak, to the being of Easter, where in the human heart, we are constantly overcoming death processes. The breath and pulse of the heart in this rhythm are actually uh, like an inner picture of the Easter festival, rhythm of the Easter festival. And then, which uh, possibly is a bit of a surprise, um, he speaks about the nerves and, and uh, points to the fact that the nerves are actually like a perpetual summer in the human being. That surprised me, at least. I didn't think of the nerves as being something like a summer process. But he says, yes, the nerves are shining out from the center of the human being to the periphery. And it's like the rays of the sun reaching into every corner of the, the human body. So it's perpetual summertime in the body, shining into the body and, of course, beyond through our senses. This process, just like in summer, the, the process of breathing out reaches to the cosmos. Similarly, the nervous system reaches out through the senses to the whole world we perceive. And as I say, in the higher senses, we reach into the other human being. 
So we also know that, of course, the, the summertime, if the sun is always shining, and I, I think California knows a lot about that, that the sun, if it gets too strong, then it gets destructive. This process, this nerve process, is actually a destructive process. If it's not kept in balance, um, then it destroys life. Life is only possible if the sun doesn't always shine. So I think that's, that's quite important to know. And there he speaks of something which is maybe also quite unusual. The central or the most important part of the uh, nervous system phase is an organ which is the highest nerve and is at the same time a perceptive organ. And that is the pineal gland, which is up in the brain. And then he says that the pineal gland is a little bit like um, when the, the summer is confronted by thunderstorms and balanced out. But the pineal gland is the organ which actually um, sort of holds this death process and allows us to perceive the light. Now, uh, this would be a whole theme of its own because uh, Koenig spoke so much about the pineal gland, its past, but particularly its future. He said that the pineal gland is actually the organ of conscience for the future. But at the same time, it was at one time the third eye of the human being. So it was an organ of perception and should become a new organ of perception. And I think in a way we can say it is the organ of light. When Rudolf Steiner invites us to um, find a new yoga process, a new breathing process, he says it will be uh, a light breathing process. And I, I believe one can understand that as part of the function of the pineal gland that we are able to breathe light, certainly for all the senses too, but the pineal gland that's like a, a central organ in our sensory life, in our nerve life. And at the same time, the thunderstorms are actually what um, uh, bring an end to this shining being of the nerves to the shining of summer when autumn comes. And so also the blood confronts the nerves in the human body and prevents them for, from um, murdering the human body, so to speak. Blood which draws in the stream of air into the body, like autumn draws the soul of the earth back into the soil. The breath of the earth is drawn back in autumn into the depths of the earth in a similar way to the, uh, the blood drawing from the periphery back into the center. So we have this dual process of breathing out and breathing in. First of all, I, I would like to qualify that still a little bit, but uh, let's stay with this twofold process, first of all. And the pineal gland, as the highest point of the nervous system, also of our sense perception in a way, uh, which is like the St. John's Festival in the human body, perceiving the light and drawing us in, because St. John's Festival is not the highest point of the year. It is three days after the summer solstice. So it is already drawing us in, into this, uh, towards this uh, winter process. 
And the, the pineal gland, of course, is this amazing organ, which, um, how should I describe that? Uh, I'm, I'm not a physician, so I can't do that so very well, but it, it is the organ which organizes the, the, um, the light processes within our body, the silica in our body. So, and it is itself, when one looks at it, it is like a little heart in the brain. It is the shape of the heart, which I think is, is actually amazing. It's this point within our nervous system that is like the breathing apparatus of the heart, so to speak, this pulsating um, process, the meeting of blood and, and nerves in this area of the, of the brain, of the nervous system. And the, the little crystals, the little chalk crystals in the pineal gland are actually arranged like um, petals of the rose. It's quite a, a fascinating organ. But let's leave that for the moment. I, I just want to point to the work that Carl Koenig did to show us how intimately we are connected with our physical body even to these breathing processes of the earth and the seasons within them. So we have these particular points within each area of our uh, physical body, which are like the seasons and their festivals, like four columns of light within for the, for the year within the course of time and in the human body within the spatial um, reality of our body. Now, uh, I would like to take a step now to this question of rhythm, the question of heart and lungs working together. And there I'll again read something out of this lecture by, by Karl Koenig. I, I just think his words are so um, good for our times today. We think of the earth merely as a living panorama of growth and decay, duality, and have forgotten that above all, a power of soul and spirit is at work, that nowhere expresses itself so strongly as at the festival times. If these festivals were abolished, as many in this age seem to desire, then not only the human being, but the earth too, would be shaken out of the true rhythm of being and lose the forces implicit in the process of breathing. Now, just knock me over to read this, I must say, but how, how important the festivals actually are, these columns of light within the year, that we um, begin to refined this process of rhythm, not because only we need it, but because if we don't celebrate it, the earth suffers. And surely that has to do quite strongly with the situation we're living with at the moment, where one can say, yeah, it's, it's not a climate crisis. It's, it's, uh, we don't have a climate anymore because I would like to decline uh, climate as the rhythm of the earth itself. It's, uh, climate is not weather. It's, it's the rhythmical being of the earth which has suffered and which is suffering, uh, particularly under the fact that we as human beings are no longer able to experience this rhythm and live with it. We live mainly against it, I would almost say. So this was 1932. It's quite strong, I think. Um, and certainly, this was something which could be experienced in a depth uh, when National Socialism was growing, because there a counterforce was coming into being, um, not only for the human being, but for the being of the earth altogether. 
that is how real these things are. And uh, I think that we live with a climate crisis, as it's sometimes called. And at the same time, with the growth, the, the, the new growth of nationalism and uh, a turning back to principles of previous times, you know, I, I think that's one of the uh, strongest experiences now that we, we find ourselves like turning back to colonial times or, or whatever. And uh, this seems to play a, an extremely uh, big part in what is happening at the moment. Something which is no longer um, actually uh, should no longer be part of our lives. So I do think that these things belong together. It's not a chance that we have these various crises at the moment, but we, it comes together in one. I think also the, the, the question of, of Corona, for instance, is one of these um, facets of the question how the human being connects itself to the rhythms of the earth and the cosmos. If we don't do that, if we don't experience the human being in, in its cosmic um, uh, origin, so to speak, we have the same origin as the being of the earth, as the being of the animals, as the plants. And yet we are not in the sense of um, Darwin, the highest creatures we've evolved, so to speak, from earth to plant to animal to be the highest animal, but that we are actually the being which can connect, can also redeem the developments of the uh, various areas of nature of the earth, of the plant world, and of the animal world. So this is where we're standing today, and I think Corona is part of this, that we have descended into the animal kingdom and are therefore susceptible to diseases of the animal kingdom, where in actual fact we should be rising towards the spirit in order to redeem the development of the um, areas of nature, the kingdoms of nature. So, uh, it, because of this, I would actually like to, to read from the same lecture of Karl Koenig, 1932, just imagine, he, he writes about this. Just as humanity stands within the kingdoms of nature, surrounded by rising surrounded by, but rising above the animal, plant, and mineral, so is the festival place in its season, but stands over and above it. It's a, an interesting comparison, I think. A materialistic science believes the human being to be the final product and offspring of the whole organic and inorganic world. Spiritual science of Rudolf Stein has taught us, however, that, material, that mineral, plant, and animal could not have come into being had the human being not existed. This is a new way of uh, looking at the situation of the earth and uh, our duty, our, um, uh, the work we have to do towards it, the redemption of nature. Mineral, plant, and animal have sprung from the human being, not the human being from them. And I, I do see uh, anthroposophy as a pathway to overcome what has come out of Darwinistic science. Kony goes on to say, similarly, the festivals are the highlights in the course of the early seasons. But for that very reason, they are the primary impulses around which the seasons have grouped themselves. They stand within the coursing flow of natural life, just as a human being stands within the kingdoms of nature. Humanity and humanity alone can bring healing and redemption into the world of nature. 
So that is a, a huge task that the human being is faced with at the moment. Now, I would like to bring one uh, more aspect into this, uh, this process of, of breathing, because I think it's tremendously important for today's world. Today's world. Uh, I mean, really, today. And that is, we have the festivals as, so to speak, an, an outer, um, these outer pillars of light that we can create within the course of the year. But we need to find also an, uh, an inner path to recreate the beings of the festivals. And Rudolf Steiner gave us this path. It was 1912 where he gave a very special um, indication of how we can school ourselves. And he, he called it a path of feeling recognition or feeling self-recognition. I think that's an amazing uh, word to use. It's a path of feeling. That's something which is missing today, of course. We have enough thoughts, but uh, they don't really grasp deep enough. We need to culture a culture of feeling which can become recognition, an organ of cognition, part in the end, of course. What did he do there? 1912. And, and I hope a few people have bells ringing with that date of 1912, because um, it's exactly 100 years after the birth of Kaspar Hauser. Kaspar Hauser, the being where Rudolf Steiner mentioned the way he lived and died, actually prevented the thread between the human being and the cosmos from being severed completely. And this is serious, I think. Our connection to the cosmos could have been completely severed had it not been for Kaspar Hauser. That's a new aspect to the question of Kaspar Hauser. But what did Rudolf Steiner do to follow on from this saved possibility of the human being to reach to the cosmos? In 1912, he gave the calendar of the soul as a path of feeling, a path of the heart towards recognition. And of course, to a recognition of the breathing process of the earth. And we know out of this, this calendar, which was 1912, 1913, that it was not understood. People didn't take to it. People didn't take it up. And this deeply esoteric impulse that, that uh, Rudolf Steiner tried to give was not accepted, was not continued. He envisioned that this would be the starting point of a completely new um, let's say, incarnation process of the anthroposophical work. So what he did, and this leads us back to the verse we heard at the beginning, um, was he sent the verses of the Canon of the Soul to the front lines in the First World War. It was the soldiers and the front line to got all these wonderful little booklets of the client of the soul. 52 verses, they all went to the front lines. They were not to be sold. They were sent to the front lines. And this is quite a, an incredible deed. There where human beings were facing death, facing the threshold, and asking about the sense of their life, certainly sense of what they were doing or whatever. There, Rudolf Steiner wrote a new forward, a new, a new introduction to the calendar of the soul. And uh, I, I would really encourage you to read this because um, it's quite extraordinary. 
He begins this forward or this uh, introduction with a, a very short sentence. And this sentence says, the earth has a life of its own, period. <laughs> I think this is a, an amazing sentence. Uh, the earth has a life of its own. What does that mean? You know, he's, he's pointing so strongly towards the fact that the, the earth is a living being. But he's also pointing, I think, to the life sphere of the earth, where the etheric Christ is living. And for the soldiers at the front lines, wasn't that so important that they were, uh, most of them, were excarnating through the, this realm of the etheric forces of the earth, where the Christ being was waiting to greet them, to take on their karmic path, Christ as the Lord of Karma. So we know, of course, from later on, from the foundation stone, that this realm of the life forces around the earth is the being of rhythm. You know, the Christ being lives in the rhythms of the earth. So to speak, this surrounding sheath of the, of the earth, the life forces, that is where the Christ being lives in the rhythms and helps us to connect, so to speak, standing between these rhythms of the earth and the rhythms of the cosmos. And then in this little introduction to the kind of the soul, he says, the soul becomes aware of the delicate yet vital threads that exist between itself, the soul, and the world into which it has been born. It's an amazing sentence, really. It's, very delicate threads, at the same time vital threads between the human being and the earth into which he's been born. That's quite something special. It's the same thing that he starts off with, the life sheath of the earth and the danger that this thread, this vital but delicate thread can also be severed. And that seems to have happened to a great extent that we are no longer uh, susceptible, no longer sensitive to this rhythmical being of the earth. Now, Koenig um, spent most of his life encouraging people to work with the calendar of the soul. And uh, this would, of course, be too much to go into in depth now, but I, I would uh, uh, like to um, invite you to our events that we are doing from the Calcutta Institute. We're trying to um, to travel a path together through the whole year with the calendar of the soul. So we are doing events every week as from Easter to Easter next year to look at these um, verses but also to see how Karl Koenig has tried to assist us in this experience, in this feeling path of recognition with pictures he's drawn for the, um, for the verses. So it'll be 52 uh, talks throughout the year, and we've already done two introductory uh, talks about that, just about this question of, of rhythm, because Karl Koenig um, tried to show us that actually it's not, um, it's not a dual process of in and out only, but through the being of the heart, it becomes a fourfold process. Just like we have this rhythm of one to four between heart and lungs, that for one breath we have four beats of the heart. In the same way, when we take one step in the weeks of the year, we actually have four beats of the heart around us 
and and this is quite clearly uh, to be experienced within the uh, language of the calendar of the soul. Karl Koenig spoke about the architecture of the calendar of the soul. It is a, a complete work of art. It is not just an isolated uh, or set of isolated verses that we can use in a linear fashion. No, we have to see how always four verses belong together and therefore give us every week a feeling of this rhythm of the earth. We are leaving the linear concept of time to experience the rhythmic being of time. That's something completely different. It's almost like a little dance we do every week. We try then not just to work with one verse or meditate one verse, but actually to include four verses at once. And we'll very soon find that actually they belong together very well we could almost say delicate but vital way so there we see that through the heart actually there are two directions in and out but there's actually four and if you imagine the um, the being of the earth um, or let's say the, the the being of time the the earthly cycle of the year, as in winter time, to be looking inwards. Then there is a crossing point of Easter and Michaelmas, and then the outer circle looking outwards in the summertime. So to speak, there, there were our nerves reach out, as as Kalkuni puts it. Winter time is looking inwards, and but if we use the the figure of the Lemnis gate, we can see how this turns at Easter and at Michaelmas into the outward looking side of the Lemnitz gate. So we actually then can recognize that it's four movements because from, let's say from St. John's, the, the height of summer, we move towards Michaelmas, which is a more inward experience. So this crossing point and from Michaelmas to Christmas, there we are at the uh, most inner point of the year. Then from Christmas to Easter, which is moving a little bit outwards. And then from Easter, this crescendo of the earth, so to speak, moving out towards St. John's. It's a, a fourfold movement that is actually in this breathing process of the earth, the time being of the earth. So we have to see the earth is not only a physical being, but because it is a soul and spirit being, it is fourfold and not just twofold. And so let me maybe get towards the, the end of the talk by, um, or actually get to the end of the talk by giving you one example of this. And, and as I say, I would encourage you to go on this path with us through the year and, and uh, see if we can come to a deeper experience of it. But um, just as an example now, um, if we take the four verses that actually belong together in the calendar of the soul, we will see we're just moving now into the, into the 50th week, going towards the east verse. And to that belongs the third verse, which is in the future. It's three weeks after Easter. We're now three weeks before Easter, then it's three weeks after Easter. These two verses are completely opposite to each other. And if we see the fourfold group of verses, the two that belong to that are the Michaelmas verses, three before and three after Michaelmas. So you see, um, it's like a Yes, like scissors opening, I don't know how to, to say that, from Easter into the future and into the past, and from Michaelmas from into the future and into the past. It's this little dance that happens every week if we uh, try to uh, meditate the four verses and not just one. And so we can see that the week we're going into with the 50th week 
um, it's a very particular one because there we see this um, balance of Michaelmas in between and, so to speak, above the third week, taking the Easter impulse into St. John's, out into the breathing outers of the earth, and with the 50th going inwards into the innermost part of the human being. And these, these two verses I would actually just like to um, uh, say a word about, or maybe just to, to read them to you, to see how in the kind of the soul, it is quite clear how the being of the human belongs to the healing process of the earth, or let's say it's a, a reciprocal process, um, healing and helping each other. And that's quite, I think it's quite central to the, to an understanding of the current of the soul. Now, um, please allow me to use my translation of the current of the soul because um, it's very difficult. <laughs> the translation is never quite quite right, quite exact, of course, but um, one has to work with it all the time. So I've just worked with the, another translation and I would like to uh, read to you the, the third week. So that will, will be the third week of Easter. To the universal all speaks, it's self-forgetting and mindful of its primal form the growing human eye. So you see, going out from Easter towards St. John's, we feel the, the universal all is already speaking to us. It's self-forgetting and mindful of its primal form. So I'm, I'm forgetting myself, I'm beginning to forget myself in this journey towards St. John's. But at the same time, being mindful that I will meet my primal form, my archetypal form, will be there to meet me. So, what does the universal all speak? We will hear in the 50th verse. But now we hear what, the, what we ourselves speak to the universal all, the third week of Easter. And what does it say? The growing human eye speaks. In your bounds, from the bonds of selfhood liberating, can I grasp my own true being? That's quite an amazing thing. With this breathing process of the, of the earth, I begin to perceive my own true being in leaving myself. Okay, that's the third week. That's, that's the future. Right? But now leading up to each of the 50th verse, it's exactly the opposite. To the human eye speaks itself with power revealing. We had... To the universal all speaks, it's self-forgetting. Now we have to the human eye speaks, self with power revealing and releasing the forces of its being, budding lust of the universal all. So it's this becoming of the universal all in springtime now that speaks to the human eye. And what does it say? Into your bounds, my life to bring and free from its enchanting bonds, can I achieve my own true goal? The universal all says to us within you, human being, I can find and achieve my own true goal. I think that's just mind boggling. <laughs> you know, this, this, uh, the way we belong together in our striving for our higher being, we belong to the being of the universal all 
going towards its own true goal. So there we see in this breathing process of the human being, the breathing process of the earth, if we can bring these together, not only do we have a healing process for our own selves, but at the same time, a healing process for the being of the earth. So I think particularly with this set of four verses, um, we can see what Rudolf Steiner really meant by celebrating Easter in a Michaelic fashion or celebrating Michaelmas out of Easter. The resurrection forces that we need as human beings, but which the earth needs and needs so badly in our times. Okay, let me leave it at that now because uh, it, you know it'd be so nice to go through every verse of the kind of the soul and, and look at this process. But of course, you all know the verses, and and uh, it's. Uh, I just think it it is so important to move from a, a linear fashion of meditating to this little dance. You know, Rudolf Steiner said to the uh, to the curative educators. Um, you need to become dancers. And I think today we all need to become healing uh, educators, curative educators. And therefore we need to make this little dance backwards and forwards uh, in the fourfold rhythm of the heart. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> I try to leave you this, this path, and and I, you know, I hope you'll join us for this work on the current of the soul because I, I do think it is so important for our time, and uh, it's it's been quite a, an experience for me. I just last week uh, I I had a, the first question and answer section with um, those who are going on this journey um, from China. And we have over 100 people in China who are taking part in these sessions. And it was, it was so amazing. I mean, I, I can't tell you too much about that now. But <laughs> it was so amazing to speak to these people and, and uh, see you know, how, how excited they are with uh, being able to um, get hold of something uh, which which is a healing impulse for the earth of today. And uh, at the end of the conversation, you know, I said, okay, and, and we have a lot of people in America who are working on this, and, and in Europe, the people joining us. And, and someone said then, but, but let's have the next conversation all together. <laughs> we can be sort of surrounding the earth doing this uh, work together with the kind of soul. So, yeah, it's been quite a, Quite an expedition for me to experience that. Okay.